Welcome back. Rich Tech Podcast. We're here live at Sotheby's for Luxury Week. Yes. Uh, not only we're we here, we happen to be in a very special room. Yeah. We are in uh, a presentation. This is an exhibition for the world of Joanne Woodward and Paul Newman. Uh, this is a special exhibition where they have artifacts, collectibles, home goods that belong to the couple on display here uh, that you can bid and, uh, and purchase. Um, so this is a, a special treat. We happen to be sitting on Paul Newman's furniture. Yes. On the man's couch. I know. It's, it's kind of <laughs> surreal. On this carpet, we got the pig. I know. It's wild. And very good taste. Um, we're joined this evening by a very special guest, my friend Chandra. Hello. Watch collector extraordinaire. How are you, sir? Good. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. Amazing. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thanks for having me. This is episode 58. Is it? I think so. Yeah, you missed 57. I missed 57. Mm -hmm. You missed 57, but we got you back. I'm glad we got you in one piece. In one piece. <laughs> <laughs> Technically, too. But yeah. <laughs> um, as is tradition, we're going to start with the honorary wrist check. I'm going to kick it to my friend, Rashawn. What do you got on the wrist this evening, sir? Um, so, so good. <laughs> I haven't been able to take it off. The man who never repeats a watch is repeating still repeating. A watch. Yes. So for those who listen, those who are watching, um, my title is the man that doesn't repeat a watch. Um, throughout our 50 some odd episodes, of course, I um, find myself wearing new timepieces. Um, and I bragged on the show about how many watches I own. Clearly over 40, 50 watches. Um, this one since I've acquired it has just been the one I can't take off. Um, 5726 um, Patek Philippe Nautilus. Um, on a custom uh, well, genre, genre so, yeah. shark skin strap. Nice. Um, I wanted to keep it aquatic, of course, with um, the shark skin. It is a professional watch, it's a diver, so like, you know, why not keep it in its um, true essence, so. Solid choice. Ben, what do you got for us this evening? Uh, I'm also wearing a dive watch. Okay. It's the Zelos Makos Hammerhead. Wow. It's number 24 to 300, I got lucky on this one. Respect. This is the one I mentioned a couple episodes ago that I had help getting. Uh, hammered, burnt orange dial. I love the so dial. It kind of looks like none the sky. Of, none of the dials are the same. <laughs> in fact, if you're in New York right now, it's it literally a looks outside, like the sky. But we'll get <laughs> through it, wild. as New Yorkers do. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I figured, I figured it was time I busted out. It has some battle scars on it, so it looks good. It looks good, now. man. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're back with us in one piece. Um, no, the piece looks amazing, and, and now you got an amazing story to tell. Oh, a watch under five hundred dollars survived the motorcycle crash. Yeah, to um, show you quality is not always in the price. I'll, I'll save our guest of honor for last. I'll I'll introduce what I'm wearing. I'm wearing a new watch. Yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> and, and this is and this is in your candid. It's kind of nice. It's kind of nice. <laughs> uh, so a few episodes back, we had a, a friend of the pod, uh, Eric Wind of Wind Vintage, on the show. And um, it was actually our first time meeting him in person when mm -hmm. we, we had him on the couch. And we kicked it off and became, I mean, we became like best friends almost yeah. immediately. It was kind of wild. Yeah. And um, he went back to Florida. I'd been scouring his website and I saw this piece and I hit him immediately and I was like, Eric, we got to figure something out because I have to have this. This is my favorite reference um, in, in this particular model. And we worked it out. It, it took about a month uh, and now sitting on my wrist is a vintage two-tone Nautilus 3800 1AJ. And I, I think I'm done collecting watches. <laughs> <laughs> you never so I'm sure I don't think I'll take it off. I think, I'm, I think yeah, I'm all right. I think I'm all right. But uh, major shout out to Eric. Um, dear, dear friend. Uh, can't wait when you and Charlie are back in town to hang out with you again. Much appreciated. I am going to wear this in good health. Uh, Shendra, what do you have for us this evening, sir? Uh, I have a Royal Oak Jumbo 15202 ST, Ooh. one of the last serials of the 15202. Amazing. Got it from AP in New York. Okay. And it's probably, it is my favorite watch. And okay. It's the one that I think has the most, like, uh, sentimental value, just because, like, the whole journey to even getting yeah. there. Yeah. You know? Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. So, moving along. Um, Shahendra, where are you from? Which, who are you? Uh, I was born in Suriname, okay. which is a small country in South America. Not most people know it. It's part of the Dutch Caribbean. Um, it's in between Guyana and French Guyana, mm -hmm. right above Brazil. 
Uh, and I moved here when I was about six years old. Okay. To the Bronx. Oh, wow. Wow. Barchester. See? Yeah. Barchester. See? Bronx you that? We're even now. <laughs> yeah, we're <laughs> even. <laughs> two guys from Brooklyn and two we guys from Bronx. We got the Yankees. We got Ralph Lauren. And we have my friend right here. Yeah, there you go. I'm in good company. <laughs> I did study. You got Michael Jordan. I studied undergrad in the Bronx. So. Okay. 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 <laughs> so, yeah, I lived there. And then uh, my family moved around a lot when I was a kid. So mm. I lived in New York. I lived in Pennsylvania. Miami, and I had my formative years, I'd say, in Minneapolis. Okay. Um, which is teenage years. And then I moved back to New York for college. I went to Hunter. Okay, wow. Yeah, nice. At CUNY. Yep. And then, um, yeah, I started in my career from there. And so your career, now I know today you work, you work in the music industry, mm -hmm. but you're on the, you're on the marketing side. Uh, yeah, so I work at Island Records. Yeah. You work, and you do digital marketing. I do creative. Creative marketing, okay. How did, uh, how does, how does this young man who moves to the U.S., grows up in the Bronx, moves around, wind up collecting watches? How, when did this love affair start with you? I think it starts, I think like with most people, and I'll date myself a bit here, like in the 80s. Okay. Um, it probably starts with like Transformers, Voltron, that kind of. Okay. Like, like when you move to this country from a tropical country, yeah. you don't really have like the first entry points are television, right? So yep. yeah. hip hop is a thing mm. with Run DMC and kind of MTV's catering. Then you have, um, you know, the, the, the cartoons. Right. And you kind of get fascinated by just this design aspect. And as you start seeing more of the merchandising, you're like, oh, I want the Transformer watch or I want the thing that looks yeah. like that. So it kind of informs a lot of like your thinking growing up mm. and the things that you're into. And like back then, you know, the coolest watch you could have was like a Casio calculator watch. Right. Right, because it told time, but it also did math. Yes. So yeah. it was like this kind of revolutionary thing. And as you get older and you start learning about more things and you start seeing the brands, you go, okay, I start, and, I, and you know, Rolex is expensive. Or this mm -hmm. is like aspirational thing. You start working towards those goals. And it's not until like, I think I entered the first phase in my career when I started seeing people who were, you know, very well uh, accomplished and that was kind of their signifier of like, oh, this is the outside of a house or a nice car or mm. whatever they had. Like these were like their measurements of success. Yeah. And then you start asking yourself, well, why that? Mm. Why that? It's, it's not, you know, this is the time, obviously, where there are cell phones and there's where they tell time. It's like, well, why are you guys still buying watches and how much do they cost? And then right. you start understanding it's not about just the utility. It's about the craftsmanship, the story, the heritage. All of these things. All of these things of, come yeah. together. And I think... You know, for me, the most important thing was, I think I came to fruition in my career at like the beginning of the, the digital social era. Okay. And at that same time is when you're seeing the mechanical world kind of take a step back, right? Mm -hmm. And for me, it's like, well, there's not gonna be a lot of these things, regardless of what they're, like I was, I still am, I bought vinyl yeah. for as long as I can remember, right? And then there was a time when people would say, oh, vinyl's not going to be a thing. And I was like, I'm still going to buy it. Yeah, I yeah. still love the art and the medium of that. Right. Um, the same way you, you start looking at, like, that is how I think I applied it to watches. Like, this is a kind of a craftsmanship thing that goes with it, mm. and it becomes more interesting. There's something it's, romantic about it. Absolutely. Right? It's the same way it's like you're talking about, you know, collecting records, and even though everything is gone digital, there's something about analog that's like incredibly warm and satisfying. And tactile. And, and tactile. Yeah. And, and there's, um, there's a spirit or nature that's involved too that requires your attention. Yeah. Right? Like the act of like getting up and, and setting your watch, winding your watch. The same thing with like putting a record on. I putting totally get Putting the record on, learning how to, where the, gro where the songs fall in the yep. groove. You know, even flipping the record over. And also you know, like you'll know when you listen to something track six is where this ends and yeah. you have to turn it over yeah. Yeah. right it's very un, it's a very intimate and involved process when mm. it comes to listening to something like that so let me ask you do you do you remember the the first time piece you fell in love with the first time piece i think i fell in love with was rolex submariner okay <laughs> right so like you get into james bond yep you see that iconic shot and, yeah. it, and it stands out it's almost like they subliminally put it in there yeah. it's like programming and, right they program they're like you need to know what this is and i mean it was a cool shot right he smokes a cigarette looks at the watch yeah and you're like with a, so with a tuxedo on yeah exactly and he's in jamaica so it's like yeah. it becomes this much cooler thing and you're like okay i james bond's wearing it and you at that time 
there wasn't anything cooler than yeah. that, right? True. And this is even before, like, again, that's before I was even born. Mm. But, you know, he's at that, I think that time, when you start watching those movies in order, like, my dad watched all the James, so we'd watch them all in order. Yeah. And, like, probably Omega was the sponsor but at the time that I was old enough to pay attention. Yeah. But I knew this was the thing. I didn't really understand why yeah. we switched. Yeah. Because I didn't know why you, like, changed watches. Licensing. Yeah, I didn't really understand that. I was like, oh, you just... Maybe that one has a missile in it or something, yeah. you know? But I was like, at the first thing, I was like, oh, that's, that's cool, mm. you know? So you brought the marketing some... worked. Marketing <laughs> worked. Yeah. And yeah, you got a question? I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Okay, uh, so you brought some, some watches for us today, too, and you have a, a special Rolex yeah. in, uh, in the watch roll. You want to pull that out? Uh, I've got this guy here. So this is a new acquisition, clearly. Yeah. Um, how did this go down? When did you when did you acquire this? Uh, I got it a couple months ago, I think. Um, and I got my started. I got it from the same person that I kind of started my buying relationship with in watches. Okay. Did you see what I did when you handed it to me? You flipped it upside down. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got it from uh, my AD, my Rolex AD, uh, George Mayer. Okay. Out of Gothenburg. Nice. Um, and you know, when I started, when I got into watches, I didn't know the right way to enter mm. so like most people I think my age I went on the internet and went on a forum yeah. went on time zone and I was like how do I get this watch is this right. a good watch and it was the Rolex Submariner mm. the no date and he actually responded and was like hey give me a call and we'll talk and yeah. I was like this is a guy from the internet like there's no yeah. way, there's no way this is legit you know yeah and he uh turned out to be very legitimate, very gracious, and talked me through the whole process. And this is like 20, 2010. Okay. So back then you could just go in, yeah. get a watch. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't what it was. Yeah, you get a sub. Yeah, you get a sub, just walk right in. And, and, yeah. and he was like, listen, try it on, see if you like it. And if, if you do, we'll, we'll, we'll make it happen. I said, okay, cool. I did that, I got it. And Back then, it was like you shouldn't have spent as much money as you did on the yeah, watch. Sure, I wasn't. And I was like, this is crazy. Um, but yeah, that was the one I got it. I still have it to this day. Actually, my cousin has it, and the deal that I have with him is you can hold on to this watch. But when your son, who's my godson, mm -hmm. turns eighteen, yeah, it's his watch. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So he's six now. Okay, he's got a little time. Your cousin's gonna enjoy that for a oh, little bit. Yeah. But I, I think that's kind of the thing, right? I yeah. think it's, it's, it goes back to like the old Patek advertisements where it's like, you don't really own them, you kind of take care of them, you pass it on to that generation. Yeah. Yeah. You don't really know where the world of mechanical watches is gonna go in terms of just longevity and mm -hmm. all these other things, and even the demand for them. I know the demand is sky high right now, yeah. but who knows what happens and you know, we walked in today and the sky was orange. So yeah. you don't know what's gonna happen. Yeah. <laughs> when, you, when you were looking for a sub, did you specifically want a no date? Well, specifically wanted a no date. Why? Because that's what Sean Connery was wearing. That's what Sean Connery <laughs> And the thing is, I did the research and yeah. I was like, oh, you know, it was like, I think it was reference 5513 or 5512. Yeah. So mm. of course I'm looking it up and I'm like, oh, I want this. Then I saw the price and I was yeah, like, like yeah, wait a minute. Uh, yeah. This is completely <laughs> different. Right, I was, I was like, this is completely different than this one. But yeah. because I, I, I had the relationship with, uh, with George, you know, he explained it to me. He was like, mm. There's this whole other thing. There's this vintage world, and you know, people are looking for gilt dials and all these other oh, yeah. kind of subculture, nuanced things that you mm. don't really know when you're getting into it. Yep. And then once you're in, you're just like, all right, you know. But the but the person who really I think, and I gave him all the credit for really, because he advised me that to even get that watch was uh, Ben Clymer from Hodinkee. Yeah. So this is this is really interesting too because so Ben Clymer, he 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 influenced you in, in getting this piece. But I know he that he was getting a lot of pieces, including yeah, this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but this was that you met him at a time like before Hodinkee was really yeah, Hodinkee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was um, I was at Rock Nation and I was uh, in the process of what would become Jay Z's website, Life and Times, which is kind of like the the world through Jay's lens mm. um, as, a, as a magazine. Jay being a big watch guy, uh, that was one of the verticals I always wanted to tackle and. I reached out to a friend of mine, I said, hey, I need somebody who kind of knows this space, I don't really know it. Mm. And he was like, oh, there's this guy named Ben, he has a, a, a blog called Hodinkee, I'll connect you. Mm. I said, okay. And I was like, I looked at the site, and at the time it was, you know, if you were looking for watch writing, it was either really, really technical, or it was very like, and it was sparse, or it was very like, 
this is out now. You can go buy it. It was yeah. like affiliate. And market. I think at this time he was running it on Tumblr. He was running yeah. it, it was on like Tumblr. A Tumblr page. It was yeah. it was a Tumblr page. He was just this guy who loved watches. Yeah. And we struck up a friendship, and he was like, "Listen, I have this story. You know, I've been wanting to write, and I've got my blog going, but I've got this other platform we can use for Life and Times, which was the name of Jay's platform." And he's like, "I want to do it on the the Royal Oak Jumbo." Mm. And I was like, "Great." Sure, man. Like you clearly know this better than I yeah. do. So yeah, it's a really, really well done piece, and it ends up actually becoming it's the first piece we ever published on that site. Oh wow! And so when I was getting into like actually looking to buy my first, like I had a Hamilton before, mm -hmm. but I only really count that as a luxury watch. It was a nice watch, but it wasn't yeah. like I love Hamilton. Yeah, it was a, a field watch. Nice. And um, he, uh, I reached out to him, and I was like, "Hey, I'm looking for you know, what should I get this Rolex?" He's like, "No, it's a good watch. It's you know, it's a great piece." You should get it. And Rolexes are great. He's like, but you should get this. You should look at this other watch. It's called, you know, the Jumbo. And I was like, yeah, from the sub yeah, to right. right. And I was like, again, this is 20, yeah. 2010. Pandora's box. So I was like, well, you know, again, not really understanding how to even get to it. And this is when AP was at other at other authorized retailers. Mm -hmm. He's like, but you can't just get it. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, that's the hardest one. And I was like, why would you tell me this? Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, no, no, just, you, know, you could figure it out. Back then, obviously, this is when the pre-owned market was a lot different. Mm. It was like, I think they were going for like 16 mm. pre-owned box papers for a jumbo. Mm -hmm. Like, insane, it's a shame. insane to think it's about that now, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get it because I didn't have the money back then. I was like, I can't afford this thing. I can't afford yeah. this thing. Mm. But it kind of put the bug in me, right? So I was like, okay, mm. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna start thinking more specifically about where I want this kind of hobby journey. Right. signifier thing to go mm. and you know every so often i'll you know still hit him to this day and be like what do you think of this yeah and then he'll send me things hey i just picked this up and i'm oh, like cool. wow you're win but i'm like you win like you've got yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> this vintage porsche and, yeah. and this rd3 like it's good it's good yeah he's done well for himself right. it's a great guy <laughs> great, great, great friend very, very so well. you get introduced to ap through ben climber what is it about ap that you found a appealing initially like what was it like when he showed it to you like all right this clicks, I get it. Well, I'd seen AP before because when I worked at Echo, you know, the principals of that company, they were like offshore guys. Mm. This is like 2005, six, somewhere around there. Okay. So like that's a time when yeah. watches were bigger and you could, they were more prominent. Yeah. So I'd known what it was. And it's actually a funny story. The guy who was the president of Echo, the number two part, the, the number two guy, I guess he was the number one guy as well. He was just the, he wasn't, yeah. the, he wasn't Mark. This guy, Seth, he was obsessed with time. So he'd go into his office and he would have a wall of just uh, hourglasses. Oh, wow. And just all he would do is just have these different uh, uh, things that would measure time. Okay. And I asked him one day, I was like, why do you, why, what is this your obsession? Yeah. And he's like, the only thing I can't control is time. Okay. So he kind of had this thing as a reminder of like how everything was fleeting and how easy it was for time to pass. Like he kind of had all these like, you know, very Zen ways of looking at it. All right. And, but he was a watch guy. So you'd always see him with a Rolex or an AP or a Panerai, like all those type of things. And I started being, okay, what's that? And he would tell me, and it's this. Okay, this is this, this is a Patek. He had a really good collection. Mm. And so as I moved further on, I kind of had the cursory knowledge of like, I knew what these brands were. I just didn't really know the heritage. And then like Ben kind of would give me the, the, the Cliff Notes or George would, and then I'd go, okay, then I'd read on my own, mm. right? So then I started just learning. So when I got into, really got into AP, it was, much like watching cartoons as a kid, it was about design. Yeah. You know, so like I remember watching, you know, even being in this room, like thinking about the things that were iconic of me growing up were really well designed cars. Right. Right. Like I'd look at the Countach mm -hmm. and the Testarossa and the Lotus Esprit and I'd go, wow, those look cool. Like they're angular. Yeah. And then you look mm -hmm. at a Royal Oak and you go, oh, this is also kind of similar angular, yeah. angular watch in a time where everything is very round. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that just spoke to me. And then also learning about the story, you know, the Genta story of like, and again, it's evolved over time, right? Like right, you yeah. Learn more, when, especially when they did the 50th anniversary. You learn more about the, the uh, you know, it was the last minute and he had to do a sketch and then, yeah. and then it worked. And it's like, it's like, it's almost like, a, it's just like one of those things where it's like. You, it's a legend. It's, it's like, a legend yeah. and it, that's what makes it cool because for me, it's like you have this thing that kind of defies expectations. Mm. It's not unlike the, you know, Michael Jordan, like the first Air Jordan. Yeah. Right? It has that same kind of storytelling that goes into it where it's like this defiant object 
that just becomes this pop culture phenomenon mm. because it went against what everybody else was doing. Mm -hmm. And it either works out perfectly or fails. Or completely <laughs> fails and no one ever talks. And people talk about it like they talk about, you know, something that could have been something and it just yeah. brick. But like I think that's kind of what always attracted you to it. And then as I learned more, you know, I just th that's kind of what brought me into, oh, there's time and date and now mm. there's chronographs and now the, you know, there's perpetual calendars and all these other things. And then I would learn more about Patek, right, who are masters of, of these things. <laughs> <laughs> and these are much higher complicated watches. And then even like, you know, when you get into that level of like, there's another layer, another layer, another layer, and all these timepieces, and there's a heritage and a great story behind them. I think what's cool, and, I, and a lot of friends that I have as they're getting into it, I think what's cool is like, they all have stories as to why. Yeah. You know, one of the coolest things for me is like helping a friend or a friend's spouse or girlfriend, whoever, acquire a piece. Because I'm like, hey, this is who you should reach out to and here's why. And then they come back and they're like, oh, wow. Like, now I have a cool story to go, why this, why I got yeah. this. You know, I yeah. saw this. It's not like I just went into the store and said, it's like buying a car. You don't mm -hmm. walk into, and most people I know don't walk into car dealerships and go, that give one. me that car. You go in <laughs> kind of with something in your head. Yeah. You know? It's so interesting. So, you know, there's a, the, the running theme there is, is storytelling. And I can't help but think about that. Perhaps there are some parallels that you see um, with collecting and your career. And I'm curious how you sort of look at the state of, of the watch industry through your lens. I think now what I've seen more is there's more of a, a, a general there's more of a general sense that you need to tell the heritage of mm -hmm. the brands and the story. I think now what I'm seeing more is there's, and, then, and I give a lot of credit to you guys, um, you know, CP Time, Hodinki, all these guys who have kind of taken this path of like, yes, there's an education on the brand, but now you're getting really specific into the actual make and model. Yeah. And I think what you're finding now, at least for my friends, you're not really finding people who are like, oh, I'm a Rolex person, or I'm an AP person, I'm a Cartier person, they're like, I'm a Santos person. Here's yeah. why. Mm -hmm. Or I'm a vintage this person here. Or I'm a, I only want these type of, you know, Daytonas and here's why. Because I think, like, it's like this room, right? Like a Paul Newman Daytona is a lot different than your standard steel Daytona, Daytona. right? Yeah. And it's because I think there's a storytelling heritage thing that goes into each individual piece. And that's why people, I think, are becoming more attractive because they're getting into the, the specificity of the whole thing. Mm. Yeah. No, that's a great observation. You had a question? Yeah, I was going to say, just listening to like your, you know, beginnings and watch collecting, we talked off camera just about how like your, you know, early beginnings in Korea and you're talking about, you know, things being much bigger and like, you know, he was talking about his time at Mark Echo on like 50 Cent when he designed um, the uh, the t-shirt. It was like mm. the only way you, you uh, wear this shirt is if you have a bulletproof vest under, which was like <laughs> his marketing and all of those kind of things and like, what I, what I think about is, you know, the purpose, the purpose and how intentional it is. And when you look around this room, everything here is very intentional. Um, you know, why you collect it, why you see the, these things this way. And it's very funny how you talk about, like, the collector now is becoming more educated. They are um, looking through a different lens. It's not about oh, you know, you have the Nautilus, or you have, you know, the hottest thing smoking. It's like, no, no, this has to speak to me. And how you started your collecting was the pieces actually speaking to you. Mm. Of course, you know, you start out, it's like, oh, yeah, I want to, you know, the, the Sean Connery, like, Rolex, sure. But then there's a part of you that's like, well, you know, I wasn't in that space then, but I will be there in, at some point. Yeah, I think you end up like, you know, there was a time when I was like, uh, uh, I need to have a Daytona. Yes. That was it, right? Like, steel Daytona. This is before. The craze. The cra I don't know. <laughs> yeah. We got to come up with a word for that. The flip. Yeah. Like, we got to have the Thanos snap before yeah. the, the watch. <laughs> the whatever blip. The, wa the blip. Yeah. <laughs> before that time. And I think for me, it was like, okay. So I, I was able to get one, you know, pre-owned. And back then, you could get them pre-owned for, for, for less, less than, than what they were retail. Yeah. Before the snap. And I got it, and I was like, cool. And I just didn't love the watch. Yeah. You know, it was one of those things where I thought that I would, what I had to get because of some mm. thing that had been planted in my head. And when I finally got it, I was like, this is fine, but it's not, it, didn't, it, it wasn't didn't special. Do it I for just you. wore it less. And I finally how, just, how long before you realized that? I think eight months I had it. And yeah. I had it for eight months. It wasn't like I 
wore it. No, you gave, yeah, you, gave, you like, gave it a chance. Yeah, and I would just start looking at it, and I was like, you're not coming out. Like, you're just going to stay right there. Yeah. And I'd force myself to, like, pretend I was driving, and I'd be like, yeah, I just, it's functional, you know? You convince yourself, like, oh, this is, you need this, this button here to figure out how fast you're going. Yeah. Mind you, this speedometer right there. And, you know, it, it was one of those things where I was like, it kind, that was kind of the moment where I was like, well, I'm only going to get what I want, and it doesn't really matter. It kind of coincided with, the, with this flip that happened, where I was like, you know, I'm going to get what I want. And then it was like, well, it's going to take a long time. Mm. Because that's when people started saying, whoa, there's a list. And, there's a bit, and I, back then, I was like, what do you mean? I had never encountered that. Yeah. But then I was like, oh, OK, I see what's happening here. Like, it's gotten more popular, yeah. and it's mm -hmm. become a thing. And so I looked at it, I was like, OK, I'll just be patient. And yeah. I'll just be very specific on the things that I like and the things that I want, as opposed to like, I need this right now. Like, yes. you know, because like you got that. Like, that's got to be special. Yes. Right? Like, it's so, it's so incredibly special. Yes. And you look at it and you wear it and you protect it and you're like, this is you, it, all the account, all the time and energy that went to getting it, not acquiring it, but just like the work that goes into it. Exactly. That's part of the thing. Mm -hmm. As opposed to like, I went and I got one. Well, it's not special. Yeah, no. Yeah, it's <laughs> special. Yes. You know? 100%. It's like sneaker collecting. You know? Yeah, like, it is. They, it's the same concept of like, you really go and you work hard and you're able to get something. I'm an immigrant, so like for me, spending money on watches, like my mom, like, what is wrong with you? Yeah. <laughs> I bought my mom her first Rolex when, for a milestone birthday, and she didn't wear it for a year. Wow. Because she just had it, and I was like, why aren't you wearing yeah. this thing? And she was like, it's too nice. And I was like, well, the whole point is for you to wear yeah. it. And then she was like, oh, I guess you're right. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's like, yeah. That's so funny. You, you, you had something? No. You talk about, um, you know, buying what you like, you come into the realizations, like I'm only gonna get what I'm like. But I'm curious if at any point, you know, because in, in your industry, you're around a lot of people with a lot of watches. If at all, at any time, did, it, did you see it influence or shape how you were collecting? Yeah, I mean, I worked for Jay-Z for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really good watch collection. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it, I think, was like, you know, I would look at that and go, he has amazing taste and amazing pieces. So he really like, does. It would, but, it, but it would be very like intentional. Mm. And it wouldn't just be like, oh, this is the new thing. It'd be very specific. And I think I you know, will say that a lot of my specific thinking came from just being around that environment where it was like, you don't necessarily want, you know, you got the bright watch, I got the right watch. It would be that type of thing where you're looking at it and going, you know, there's, this specific piece in this reference number in this thing and it doesn't necessarily matter if it's limited or not mm. it's really about like is the configuration interesting mm -hmm. okay and like you know john mayer another person that when you see what he obviously when he anoints something yeah it just goes. <laughs> goes. but i think he's one of the people when he's like yeah this is a cool piece because it's it's gold with the green face and everybody slept on and then the daytona that daytona shoots I know. up and because he just him. right because he's looking at it like this is interesting. And that's yeah. kind of how I think I started look like, you know, I'm not any of those guys, but I look at it and go, this is what I like. I know what I like, Yeah. you know? And for me, it's like, it's not for anything else outside of just uh, rewarding yourself for being able, you know, you're in a very privileged position when you get to go purchase any, any watch, regardless right. of, of price point, because they're not necessarily utilitarian anymore, right? Mm. If you really think about yeah. what it is, it's really you get a luxury. Phone, you can, right, exactly. Yeah. You can look at the sun outside. <laughs> it's really a utilitarian, you know, thing, but it's also kind of it's a, it's it's a signifier of a lot of like hard work and things that go into Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And then also, you know, there's other things that are other factors in your life and if you're able to get what you want or mm -hmm. work towards it, the time that it takes even makes it more special. Yeah, you appreciate it. Yeah. So it's like for me, like this watch was you know, I had a milestone birthday, so it was like, in theory, I'm like, yeah, it took me 40 years to get this. Yeah, wow. I mean, like, yeah, that's, that's how a, I looked at it. That's a great it. way well, of looking did, at it. Yeah. It did, right? That's it took me 40 yeah. years yeah. to get this watch. That's how when people are like, how long did you wait? I'm like, 40 years. Yeah. Like, if that's how long it took me to get this. Because from that time and from that thinking, and then, okay, do I need this? Why? Like, what, where does it fit in the world? Like, do you really need this? You already have a couple, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then it becomes like, oh, I just flipped my perspective on it, because I was like, well, that's the milestone that you've accomplished here. And then like, that's kind of the position and the thinking that I take on these things now. It's like, what's the point of it? Why did you do it? And like, you know, being around people. Mm -hmm. And even when I see certain, you know, friends of mine or even artists that, that, I, that I work with or that I know, 
when they're getting certain pieces, I'm like, oh, they got, they got something because it, it, it's a signifier. Yeah, definitely. And it's special and it's interesting. Yeah. You know? It's so funny, you know, you, you talked about it took you 40 years to get this piece. It reminded me of uh, a comment a friend of ours made once. He had purchased, uh, our friend Tyler, he had gotten his first Rolex was a vintage service uh, watch. Right. And so it was engraved on the back. It was like, like Robert Smith, thank you for 24 years of service. And he said, he's like, this man worked 24 years for, for me, me to, to get, get this watch. Yeah. This watch. <laughs> yeah. it, was, I, it was funny, but yeah. at the same time, when you think about it like that, it's, it's, it's interesting. So moving back, you know, you, when you think about it and, you know, your journey in collecting, you, you kind of had like a really great experience in terms of, um, I guess, sort of a, um, I guess we could call it an early watch education by being able to tap resources, you know, like a Ben before yeah. Hodinkee blew up, like Jay-Z before people really knew the, you know, the magnitude of his watch collection do you ever like reminisce on on those engagements kind of think like man we were kind of like ahead of the curve or like yeah yeah all the time mm. <laughs> <laughs> in the sense of like you know what it is it's like when you when you're ben's like one of the people that i look at and go he's just so passionate about yeah. these things that being able to have him as a person that I could ask about certain things and you know, it's not like thumbs up, thumbs down responses, right? Sure, it's yeah. Like, it's like detailed, here's what I'm thinking, mm -hmm. here's why, here's what's important, here's what's special. Have you thought about this other thing, though? Um, you know, I think for me, when you're, when you're at that point, it kind of helps shepherd you through the journey and you start thinking about things in a more uh, intentional way. Yeah. And then as you meet further on, as you get to this other point, you start meeting people that are, have that same mentality, but they're also like, they become really good advisors yeah. in terms of just like overall don't do that, right? Or have you, or why are you doing that thing? That's interesting. You know, like I have a good friend, uh, Yoni, he's the head of watches at Material Good and I'll hit him and ask him just a random question like, what do you think of this? And he'll, his response is always really candid. It's just kind of like, you know, well, is this something that you feel is gonna help your collection or is this special to you? And then I'm like, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like his kind of phrasing of it. Yeah. And, and I think what happens with, with people like that, when you have friends like that, they're not telling you yes or no. They're just kind of making you ask the right question of like, did you really think this all the way through or did you see whatever came out of Watches and Wonder? Like, yeah. Right? yeah. Just like I've done that. Right? Like, I've yeah. seen like the thing that comes out and I'm like, oh, now I need, you know, when the Oyster Perpetual, the the fun dial one. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. I'm like, like you're, you're dipping dots. I'm like there, right? I'm like, I'm like, I need that. And then I'm like, after I send the email, I'm like, I shouldn't. Have I don't even know. Like, there's no reason. Like I just yeah. created, you know, I convinced myself. Yeah. So I know how important technology is uh, in your career with what you do. I'm curious if at all you apply the, the, the same lens or um, are you paying attention to advancements in technology and, and, and watches? Does that matter to you? Do you? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess I don't really know, like, I don't know what technology, new technology you can apply to mechanical watches, mm -hmm. you know, like, because I think that's what takes away the whole thing. At least when you get into the higher, like the less. Like high thing. horology. Yeah, yeah. Because then it becomes like, it's like Aston Martin, like, you know, when you see one and you open the engine bay, it has the guy who made, you know, this person inspected the car. Yeah and it's stamped and you're like, okay, that's cool. Like, this is a person that did that. Yeah. I don't know, like, I haven't seen anything where I look at and go, that's a cool thing. Mm. You know, there's some technological advancement. In terms of pure technology, what I do see is like, you know, there's these really talented watchmakers that are coming up with new configurations and they're like, oh, how do you fit this, you know, configuration that normally works in a 42 millimeter watch into a that's 37 yeah. Yeah. and I'm like well that's to me that's, that's crazy cool. yeah. so I'm like you know what do you think about like well I'm gonna play devil's advocate it's Grand Seiko spring drive I think those are great watches do you do but do you see that as an advancement in mechanical I think the, watchmaking? they're like you know quartz and, and spring drive, there's a right? quartz yeah. in it there's a right. quartz crystal in it but the watch is mechanical I think again it's one of those things where like they're trying and they're experimenting do you think it's kind of gimmicky I don't think so I think I mean I don't think anything's really I think the position that I take this probably sounds like a political answer but it's like, if it's something that they're trying and it hasn't been done and it's like, yeah. oh, that's 
and there's an audience for it, I think they should be able to do that. I think when it becomes gimmicky, when, if it's like, we're gonna do the spring drive and that's the only thing we got and it's gonna be 15 different colors. One, one right. trick pony. One trick pony. Right. All right, that, that becomes less interesting. I think it's like, and nothing, there's no variation, right? Mm -hmm. There's no complication, there's nothing yeah. additional to it. I think that's when you're like, all right, you're kind of riding that wave. Mm -hmm. Um, even when people have, if I've had friends that say, oh, the moon swatch is a gimmick. I'm like, it's not for me, but it's cool. Yeah, like, I get yeah. it. I told you it's sure. a fun watch. And some people just like, this is not their thing. It's no. okay. Yeah, they yeah. want a watch. Yeah. They don't need that one. That one. Yeah. Sure. You yeah. know? I'm curious. We just, all need this one though. Just oh. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I was going to, go ahead. What I was going to mention is when, you know, when I'm looking at the couch, we all have like, um, 70s design pieces like these all influenced from the 70s and when you were talking about or Perry when you asked about like innovation and watchmaking and I was having this conversation with a gentleman earlier today and I told him I was like um, in my opinion I don't think there's any new way to make a watch of course like you know you do have watchmakers that are adding um, like you said, how do I make this movement small or, you know, mm -hmm. oh, let me rework the wheel on this complication, et cetera, and so on and so forth. I think the best era in watchmaking was the 70s because it pushed the, um, the idea of design mm -hmm. and the external and why you loved and why you appreciated these watches. And then when you fast forward into today, you know, if you take, for example, and this is not to bash any brands, but you take like, you know, Gerard Perigot versus, you know, the AP, mm -hmm. right? And the Royal Oak, and you go, oh, you know, these guys are copying these guys or whatever, and who was first to this and that. It's like, but the influence was that period. Now what you're seeing today is more of the aesthetics of things changing. Mm -hmm. So like, now it's not, let's make a new case, let's not make a new, um, you know, complication. Now you're seeing watches crazy color green dials and you're seeing this and you're seeing that. Yeah. Like you're you're going back into the essence of why we loved and appreciated these watches. And it's not about what's this and what's that and what's better and what's not, you know? Yeah. If that, I, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. I think, um, you know, to your point, um, that period, you know, I think when you think about the 70s through the 80s and what was happening in, in the watch industry, you know, with the rise of the quartz crisis and then just different like art design movements and everything. It was just a clash of ideas that I think uh, you had groups of people, some of them together, others separated, that were just pushing the envelopes in, in several different areas. And, you know, we got lucky, I think, with Gerald Genta uh, during that period, designing two of probably the most iconic silhouettes for two of the probably most iconic brands today. Mm -hmm. um, and so now we're spoiled. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, wrapping up, um, I want to ask, you know, obviously, I know you love AP, you love Rolex. What other brands are, are you looking at today in terms of where you, you may be going next with, with collecting? Patek. Patek, okay. Jorn. Jorn, really? Yeah. Jorn. Okay. Yeah. What is it about Jorn that you like? I think there's a great story. Everything. There is. Right? Everything about it. <laughs> yeah. When you try them on, they're amazing pieces. They it's really also, are. It's a great story, right? Yeah. It's a story of... of, of you know, the, the myth is, what is it? It's like it's 900 a year, yeah. only 300 for the U.S., and yeah. there's only three stores, and there's a whole there's thing. There's six black labels there's, in yeah, the country. Yeah, there's all, there's all these things yeah. you got to do. And I think it's more like, and then you see the pieces, and you're like, oh, these are really cool pieces. They're amazing right? They're uh, amazing pieces, pieces yeah. and the way that they're finished, I think, is really, really good. Patek is obviously, it's like, you know, it's like, yeah. Yes. It's like, do you like a car? Do you like Ferrari Force? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, how could you not? It's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. Yeah. Um, I think those, probably those two. Okay. Um, I don't know if there's anything else on top. I mean, those are two great ones. Yeah. I mean, but then the other thing too is like you start as you, as the further you get into it, I think now even more so, you know, than the, uh, uh, the other brands, you start going back into the older vintage models. Exactly. And the stuff that's discontinued or like alternate that's versions. That's where my heart is. I yeah, love Yeah, and then vintage. I'm like, wow, that's a cool, yeah. and I saw Nikki Faldo AP the other day. Oh, oh my And I was like, this is just a, Weird, a cool, yeah, yeah. The tantalum and I was like, is a cool, weird looking watch, yeah. right? Never like, seen the full kit to those, uh, -uh. cufflinks, a belt. Oh, yeah, I heard, I've, I've heard about it, yeah, so silly. So, I mean, that's the thing, it's like you see that, and it's like it, it, it kind of speaks back to what you're saying, like the 70s stuff. It's like you have like people were taking design risks with fonts, yeah, yes. right? Seriously. And and when you start seeing things like that, you go, wow, like that's an 
interesting way of doing something. And, and that's kind of where I'm looking at it now. It's like, you know, there's other newer or brands that I don't collect, but also even within the portfolio of the stuff that I do collect, it's like, there's just things that are uncovered in there. I know. Weird and more interesting. Just, yeah. and there's always more. Yeah. Well, this was this was a real treat, my man. Thank you for joining Thank you for us this me. evening. Yeah. Um, really, really enjoyed this conversation, and um, it's been an absolute pleasure. You know, I think the the main thing that I've come along with, um, sitting down with you, and what I love is I love to see, you know, someone that is a, a, a consummate watch collector, but that that also like really enjoys the the path of and journey for discovery. Thank you. You've got uh, you know some amazing people that have helped you along the way. A <laughs> yeah, little bit of the cheat code, He's got the cheat but we won't hold that against you. Um, I, I I'll sell the I, internet. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine what those conversations were like. Humbling. And, um, we'll have to have you back on some other time uh, to speak at length about those. But cool. much appreciated. Thank, Thank you for joining you. us this evening. Uh, you all know where to find us weekly, every Wednesday. Uh, Risk Check Pod on Instagram. Uh, you can watch us on YouTube. You can watch us on Spotify and listen on Spotify. Yes. Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, we're on Amazon Music, and maybe one day we'll be in the metaverse. I don't know, no, right? Never. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. It's been a real treat, and uh, we'll see you next week.